common theme of H.P. Lovecraft's work was an all-powerful ancient evil with the power to destroy worlds laying in a dormant hibernation state, while lesser supernatural forces and even power-crazed men worship their might and eternal presence. This is similar to the dynamic of Ken Olin's This Is Us and His Writer's Room. Ken Olin is a great one of TV. He shows up all throughout TV history, helping bring shows like 30-something and Alias into the world of mortals. A rare type of showrunner and EP who has created hit after hit. Olin may as well be eternal in this land of evil. There is no special knowledge, but a natural malicious instinct on Olin's part. A total awareness of what bullshit can be shoved down the gullets of Americans and how to browbeat them into beliefs, emotional swings, and addictions to his harmful powers. But great ones are usually sleeping. Their most notable works of destructive malice having been committed long ago. Olin, however, is very active and still bringing horrors into this world. He may be at the peak of his powers because his hit drama, This Is Us, is so breathtakingly wicked that I think it will form a terrible, manipulative, arcane TV type for years to come. This Is Us centers on multiple generations of the Pearson family, which contains one set of twins and an adopted brother. We live through the Pearson's ups, downs, their laughters, and their tears. And there are so many goddamn tears. This is a group of people who get diagnosed with three different types of cancer and suffer a couple of miscarriages before their pot of coffee is done brewing in the morning. That's an identity quirk of this type of show. You see, there's always been melodramas where characters have to suffer a statistically unlikely barrage of events, and that's part of the deal. That's what you have to do in order to make a show like that work. But this is us as special. The sheer volume and pace of the tragedies and suffering are so powerful that they may as well not be there. Characters go through such incredible trauma but always snap back to being the pliant cardboard we were introduced to them as. I've already done an episode uh, about this show on my Precursor series, and it is, in fact, what got all of this going. Like uh, any Lovecraft protagonist, I was drawn to investigate a call of evil that then engulfed my life and my sanity. Also, I am racist. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But this time I'm diving deeper, and most importantly, I have another investigator who will suffer massive sanity loss. So, let's dive in. This is... Yes. Why? (laughs) Why? (laughs) Why did we... Why do we have to watch this? There's so many other ones we could have watched. True Detective? Uh, we didn't do The Walking Dead. How do we not do The Walking Dead? I, okay, so, I mean, we did talk about Walking Dead, and our stipulation was that it's like kind of a drama, but it's more like oh, it's that's this right. weird it's too sci-fi it's nether. Too, yeah, it's never, too sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, and when it came down to it, I feel like this is going to affect TV more than Walking Dead. That I mean, was my main quality. There are already not only is it a huge show, just got done. It's in the middle, I guess, of its fifth season. Gonna have yes. a sixth. It's got three. It's Olin's got his own shit. He's doing movies. Uh, there are three versions of it in other countries. There is a French version called "I <laughs> Promise You." There is a <laughs> oh, Dutch version called "This Is Us," but in whatever pigged in weird German. <laughs> this this it's called is called Je- Je- Get yeah. Jin V. Just and rolls then, off the fucking tongue. Best of all, there is one in Turkey. It only landed for one season <laughs> called A Family Story. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, there is a the Turkish d- version of This Is Us. I'm assuming that they that the adopted kid is like Kurdish or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like thinking about Turkey now, it's like the f- craziest they could get is he's like Azari. Yeah. <laughs> like Armenians are that's the only this is us that really has like a ton of villains and they're all just different ethnicities who <laughs> look exactly like them. But uh I did not know about the Turkish one. I knew about the Dutch one. I always thought that was interesting because I consider the Dutch more important to American identity mm-hmm. than uh the British. Interesting. I I I mean that's I don't know. This is something I thought of while I was there, but my thinking is both are very important in the creation of capitalism. Absolutely, but I would say the Dutch is how the Dutch talk about capitalism and historically portrayed it and portrayed commerce was more. It informed the American way of processing that more. Mm-hmm. 
they romanticize it and have this like similar cultural optimism to Americans, I believe. Yeah. Well, I was I can't but, wait to watch Dit Vin uh, Dit Jin V. Uh no, I will never watch it. I will never <laughs> I will hopefully never watch any more of anything Ken Olin has to put out because thankfully there's still truth in labeling in entertainment and they can't <laughs> trick me and I can't be compelled. Watch every episode I watched of this show, I just felt like I was being slowly smothered by a pillow. Yeah, well, I mean that's what's fucked up. You could avoid Ken Olin for the rest of your life, but it's like you know, like Lovecraft, you think you're out of like whatever awful gods like cavern or whatever, but it's like, oh, the police chief in the town like worships this thing as a god. You That's think true. you're safe, yeah. but you're not. The, the, and it's like the influence is gonna be everywhere. Everyone is gonna try to write shit like this because it's like this is so depressing because it's like yeah, it's you're being smothered by this pillow and it's the most cynical fucking shit you've ever seen. Like oh. I'm gonna give you just an example from the like uh the most recent season there's a scene <laughs> god damn uh yeah there's a scene where sterling k brown's character is uh he's sitting on his stoop uh during his 40th birthday he's uh <laughs> like his this like 13 year old who's dating his 13 year old daughter comes by and like they start shooting the shit but the kid talks like a 43 year old man he's oh like hey God, uh, every yeah. fucking character yeah like hey getting old or oldly going <laughs> you know, like and they do that bullshit for like five minutes and then <laughs> yeah then fucking uh randall sterling k brown goes so did you see the video and the 13 year old boy goes george and they have like the most yes, ham-fisted conversation. Oh god! Oh my god! About like police brutality and shit. Yeah. And it's so just to give a little flavor to this scene. Uh, Randall is a commodities trader. <laughs> like just to give the full like portrait of this scene. But like that's like it, it's like every scene is like that. Yeah. It's like just like this awful old man Olin just like fucking strapping you down and being like, yeah, here's some black lives matter shit. Here's some, here's some shit. Here's some shit about like weight loss, body dysmorphia. Here's some other shit. Uh, here's a guy getting cancer. Here's like a tender moment between like, uh, you know, a black father and son. And it's like, so everything looks like an insurance commercial. Yes. Oh God. Like, that's yeah. what really fucked with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, it, everything looks like one of those, the sad ones they show during the super bowl where like, the kids got to go off to school and everyone's sad. It's just flat. Everyone's standing in like a, a in the driveway with like a SUV in the background. Yeah, everyone's like every like mom is like sitting in a kitchen with like the most unnatural sunlight piped through. Yeah. While she looks on and sees like a kid playing in the backyard. And then it's like you expect a voiceover that's like, you know, yeah. The mo moments in our life are special because they don't last, but yeah. we can make them last. Prudential. <laughs> like, yeah. it just, it's so, like, it's so, you know how there's that Hallmark look and that soap opera look? Like, there's an identifiable low rent look. Yes. I, like, I wish it, it should look like that per the content of the show, but the commercial look is so fucking off putting it's to me. Very, like, it makes it's so my, sterile and gross. And it makes all of the attempts, the ham fisted attempts that, at dealing with issues and and being uh and and trying to plunge like the psychological depths of these characters all the more off-putting because it really highlights this the the cynicism of the whole thing because there's no attempt to make the actual portrayal of any of this visually uh emotionally interesting like there's no attempt to uh to create a world it's just here you know ask your doctor about microaggressions <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like it's so like it's for a person of such like low insight ability <laughs> it's like the the people that this like filming technique works on are the same people who like 
fucking made that poor woman in the uh, AT&T commercial like leave the country. Yeah. Oh. Like they're so like <laughs> yeah. affected by visual stimulus and shit that they just can't handle it. They just cannot. They're the people who, who logged on to uh to GoDaddy to see the the uncensored version of the commercial because they just got that <laughs> horny for Danica Patrick. Yeah, it just, the lowest level of like awareness and cognition like they i think for a lot of people watching this they're not aware it's a show yeah, i think we're at they that think point. these are real people <laughs> but that's so you said sterile and that's a huge part of this show because it, it reminds me of something uh my sister said about a similar show that was probably like created because of this is us where they're like we got to keep you know capturing this lightning in a bottle uh and it's that all the characters are very pliant and they're very docile in a way like they do have like dramatic personality traits or they they wisecrack or they're like a you know they get really mad sometimes but all their flaw like their flaws are so like never impede them doing the absolute right thing yeah and even when they do the wrong thing it's with the purest of intentions uh, no matter what awful fucking thing happens to them, they're just bouncing back with a wisecrack or like a lighthearted moment. Like the t- there is this weird rhythm in this show that I noticed, like this maddening hum that now I feel like only I can hear <laughs> and like makes me want to like bite the skin off my fingers till there's bone. And it's like this happens like at least twice an episode where a character will list like everything bad that's happened or like is wrong with them. And then there's a joke thing because it will always be like, like Kevin, who's like the sort of like airhead, but actually a better person than you initially realized actor brother, uh, who's like, is a good person because his sister's fat. Um, (laughs) he like, yeah, he doesn't like throw rocks at her whenever she comes around. Yeah. So you can tell he's a good guy, but like he's, um, and this is a scene that I like really stood out to me because it's so NWO in so many ways. But he's like he's just knocked this girl up. They're living together because it's quarantine, and um, she ca- she's they like have an argument. Then he's working out in the garage, during which there's an interminable scene of like his dad working out in the garage, uh, like seventy years ago. And then him working out with his dad in the garage like 30 years ago. Like they love doing that. They love blowing the audience's mind with the idea that like children are related to their parents. Yeah. Like, but that, yeah, this show just constantly, the, their big like lost level mind blower is that time exists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it, it's fucking insulting. But uh, so like this woman that he knocked up comes in there and talk about their argument. And then blah, 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 like awful dialogue, awful dialogue. And then he goes, um, I'm addicted to alcohol, working out, and the feeling of being on a red carpet. Oh, yeah. And uh, I liked, uh, you know, I I liked the Wolverine movie. It'll be something <laughs> like that. It's like they always do that. Where yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bipolar depressive. My mom, I, my mom just said first she didn't. I just found out my mom didn't want to have me. Um, and my husband died yesterday. And uh, I went to an alias convention or something. <laughs> and it's like, what the, like, what the fuck is that? Like, he thinks that's how- Ken Olin is so like, he's only talked to other great ones or people who are totally like in awe of his power. So like he's when he was right, when he's thinking of the show, he's like, how did disgusting like <laughs> the disgusting lower creatures talk to each other? Oh, they probably bring up one funny one when they're talking about how like. You know their uncle, their uncle who abused them, like got into a boat accident, and it, they also just uh, got their high school p- girlfriend pregnant after not seeing them for twenty years. Like they would, t- they would do a funny one after, and it's so like the first time it's like, oh, that's just bad TV writing. But like the fiftieth time it happens, it's like, no, this is like a pathology or an MK Ultra trigger. <laughs> yeah, I think that might be it. Yeah, it's. <sighs> I, I like it really upset me in this go around. Like the first time I watched it, I think it was like the world was so bad in such a like hopeless seeming place that it, it was like I could accept this because it like it, it just like went with the rhythm of the world. Like I knew it was shitty, but I couldn't th- I think I couldn't fully realize how awful it was. And watching it now, like I got physically fucking angry at this. I'm I I 
so we, should we start like should we yeah, introduce yeah, the yeah. show because uh yeah i i i now have have had to watch this and and i i'm not happy about it so we should we should i because I, there's some stuff at the beginning that sets the stage that just jaw dropping so jaw dro- yeah yeah so let's lay it out so this show is it's about how parents and children are related so Milo Ventigliama. Uh, <laughs> Parents do be having kids. <laughs> yeah, that's what this show should be called. Milo Ventigliama, Jack Pearson, is married to uh, Rebecca Pearson, played by Mandy Moore. They're like a sort of young, you know, good looking, sort of hip couple in the 70s. And Rebecca is pregnant with triplets. Uh, one of the kids dies during childbirth, but a like homeless drug addict just abandons his kid at the hospital that day and the Pearsons adopt him. And these are known as the three. Because Kate- yeah, it's like, oh, we lost one. Not never mind, got another yeah. one. <laughs> That's how it works. Like if you're in a hospital, they're like, hey, we uh we have an extra one of these. Like yeah. we noticed like like it's like your fries fell out of your bag. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Kate Pearson who's like main trait is that they have her be fat. Yeah. There's Randall, who's like that with being black, yep. and then there's Kevin, who's that with being an actor. Yes, which is an equivalent uh, burden. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I wanted to say first is that would really just set the whole tone for me is that when we see Kevin for the first time, he is the star of a popular but bad but dumb like Chuck Lorre style sitcom called The Manny. And he is having a crisis of uh, of like integrity that leads him to doing an epic uh, uh, rant at an audience, like a Howard Beale style thing about you guys like this shit, fuck you. And that, yes, is siloed right next to the the his his ver- his large sister dealing with her uh, her weight problem. And I just watched that, and I just thought. Okay, this is a protagonist. <laughs> yeah. This is this is this is a, a an inciting incident of like uh of like crisis and concern. Like the first scene is him and his birthday, like at a big Hollywood party, but he's sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like they they like try to make him interesting by giving him by making it so he's like vain and shallow, but it's like those aren't really important because of course he tr- he oh it turns out he's a good guy who like does the right thing when he gets his chick pregnant or like he's nice to his big sister yeah like it, it's all shit like that so it's like okay so those didn't matter those don't like don't affect what the character does so, yeah like, yeah cares? nothing affect none of these none of the 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 character's flaws affect their actions which means that they really are just sort of affectations more than anything yeah, it's like they're maddeningly hollow. And okay, so with the first season concerns like their major storylines and the storylines are like, yeah, Kevin is like he doesn't feel like he's taken seriously as an actor. Oh, poor um, guy. yeah, the toughest thing that could happen. Uh, Kate is uh, like she's having trouble losing weight, but then she meets like another guy played by an actor who is not overweight and they had to wear a fat suit, which is like an amazing choice. (laughs) (laughs) Such a weird choice to make. But, um, and it's like sort of her struggle with him telling her she doesn't need to lose weight and like her lifelong body image, like whatever. And yeah, she basically meets Joss Whedon. Yeah. 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 He meets like, she meets like fatter Joss Whedon. Yeah, this like he's epic, even got the same like bald head and beard and shit. He no, he's made from that cloth. Yeah, and it's like they they like the scenes with them are like fucking interminable, brutal. Like maybe the worst in the show because she'll be like, and, you know, I gotta lose weight, and he's like, um, no, I think you have to lose your dress and get back into bed with me. <laughs> and it just like that the fucking repulsive back and forth for the entire episode, and um. <laughs> Hey, uh, the storyline with Sterling K. Brown is his dad who just like left him at the hospital. <laughs> it's like he's stopped doing heroin after like 30 years. And he like he like Sterling K. Brown finds him and is like, uh, OK, you have to live with me and like get chemotherapy because, of course, he has fucking cancer. Oh, yeah. 
and it's like and also his conflict with like you know microaggressions and like his place in like the white world which like ken Olin ha- handles masterfully as you'd expect out of a guy who was born in like um like 1921 <laughs> like does an amazing job but those are yeah those are like the major storylines and really like so i'm on the fifth season and it's like there's a bunch of individual ridiculous things that happened like Part of the one of the inciting incidents for like their current state is that Jack Pearson dies. Yes, he died before the events of This Is Us, and his best friend Aceveda, <laughs> an, an age tech tech Aceveda, uh, from the Shield, uh, marries Rebecca Mandy Moore, and it's like it's filled with these like it, it, it's like someone. At its best, the show is, like, someone who, like, kind of knew this family, like, telling you how fucked up they are and you don't really care. And at its worst, it's, like, looking into Cthulhu's eyes. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, like, that. that's what's we fucking unnerving about this show is that as much as I see, like, there's practically no difference for there to be individual episodes. Oh, yeah. Like, the plot moves forward, but it's just, like... It's just all one undifferentiated blob. That and that is the most insidious thing about it. Just as as a byproduct of of like the the prestige television revolution and the emergence of the serialized storyline. One of the what ha, what has ended up happening is is that you've gone from having an old model, you know, Rockford Files, where every episode is totally distinct, to you had you know that attempt by those first couple of transitional shows to build a world where you've got individual episodes that have within them an internal arc and stuff. And then, but also refer to events that carry on throughout a season. This is us is that the end point it's at the end. And that makes sense because this is the most recent show we've been talking about uh, where individual episodes have lost any uh, structure. It's just stuff happening. Yeah, and it's like, and it might as well not be happening because it doesn't actually affect the characters. Yeah, you're still getting the same like bullshit. Like, well, it's it's th- it's people's problems minus consequences, which aren't problems. They're just it's just neurosis. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, that's. I mean, I'm curious to, to see what episodes you watch because it's just like it's a grab bag it's a fucking it's mad libs like what bad thing happened to them yeah it's a bunch i well i saw a, a lot of the first season and uh i watched uh, the la- this the one that's on now uh which really is breathtaking in the way that it cynically uh hits every like issue the yes. way that it, it it decides that the way to be relevant to people is to just reflect and this is not, and this is, I think, where you're right about the insidiousness of the Olin model is that I think, as like artistic, uh, as any kind of artistic insight goes out of the making of these shows, what's replacing it is this uh, uh, just reference to the moment to try to uh, basically trick the audience into thinking something matters because they're taking their response to the moments that they're in and they're applying it to the show and then kind of uh, imagining that the show is where like they're actually getting this emotional response as opposed to just the fact that the show is just a mirror. And that is more and more what TV is and, and all this content that we're consuming is becoming is just an algorithmically generated mirror of the moment. Uh, and yeah. yeah. And I do think that's sort of like the... If there's anything that's like actually artistically interesting about the show, that's the one thing is that they have seemingly like captured the feeling of being alive in this time where events feel completely disconnected from consequence. Nothing seems to really snap you out of whatever cycle this is, and we're at the end of something. Yeah. You get that all of that. It- you get just the bad feeling of the moment without any insight into it, any ability to have any kind of meaningful catharsis or confrontation with it. You just marinate in it. Yeah. And every once in a while, that's most of the feeling of watching the show, but every once in a while in an episode, you'll get something that's like so fucking ham fisted that it's, you actually like fully remember it. Like it's hilarious. Like the, like 
the police brutality conversation we talked about or like the way that Jack's character dies, which is someone gives him a shitty pressure cooker or a slow cooker and he like <laughs> it's just like it kills him. Like their house burns down and he inhales smoke and dies. Yep. And like how abrupt and stupid that is or like the way that they give like Jack's character fascinates me. That character is the weirdest character to me because, yeah, he's the father. He's played by Milo Ventigliama. And it's like they do every bad every bad thing they do, they do with Jack, but to a higher degree. Like, for instance, one of his flaws, like before they have the triplets, is that he is an alcoholic. And then Mandy Moore is like, you have to stop drinking. And he like goes to the bar to bitch to Aceveda about drinking. And he's in Aceveda is like, okay, you have to stop drinking. And then he just does. Yeah. It's like one hard afternoon. Yeah. Him. You know what? You're right. I should stop drinking. Thank you for that. Yeah. He like fought in Vietnam and like had a bad father and all this shit. But he's like in a show where every character is pretty pliant. He is the most like he is the most adaptive, like least bitter. He has no bad traits, not even a hint of one. And like so that's why he get, just get uh, get just die. Be like, don't worry about it. I don't mind. Well, that's like, yeah, I, I, it's like not novel to notice a lot of like Jesus Christ allegories in fiction, like things like the Matrix. They were like really a lot of action movies have that type of thing. But this is something more insane because they make him like they make him like a new messiah. He is yeah. the flawless American who can accept every bad thing that has ever happened to him. And then we fucking kill him. That's part of his journey. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like Jack is instructive because it's what Ken Olin like thinks that everyone below him should be like. Yeah. You just need to suck it up. Yes. I like, yeah. I, fr- Olin is an interesting guy because he's like, if you go to his Twitter, it's like all like sort of like Hollywood liberalism and like a kind that sort of even, he's an old guy so it's from a different era where he'll like even go out and say like oh i don't think there should be billionaires but you know like most hollywood liberals will have a time where he shows his like true teeth and i remember in like february he was like angrily adding bernie and being like stop criticizing michael bloomberg (laughs) (laughs) like shit like like you need to drop out and it was like Oh, that's, like, he's really just, like, a vicious, awful guy, like, everyone in Hollywood is. And I don't mean, like, he's mean to other screenwriters. Like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, like, they have I a hope, I hope ev- They deserve I nothing hope ev- but pain. Yeah, I hope every screenwriter is mean to each other. Fuck them. Fuck everyone. But, I mean, just, like, his view of the world and his view of America is vicious. He's a vicious person who, like, it- it's not just, like, a predator who thinks he's, like, who perceives himself as the top of the food chain, it's like a man domesticating animals to be slaughtered. <laughs> like, that's how he sees the world. Yeah, he's like, his insane. shows are like the uh, the Temple Grandin hug machine that they put yes. the cows in so that they don't ruin the meat with all their thrashing before they get the captured bolt in the forehead. That's exactly what this show is. It's so, like, the thing I identified about it uh, when I first watched it is that it's, like, instructive. It's like, Telling Americans, like, hey, do you have cancer? Do you want Medicare for all? Like, hey, do you, like, um, have you just, like, had a bad time in life? Like, you, every job you've ever had has destroyed your body and been terrible. Like, are you, you know, do you feel trapped? Do you feel like the world's been unfair to you? Well, fuck you. Be a better person. You have your family, you fucking cocksucker. Yeah. You but live in America. Like, you have yeah. options. How, it's even funny. if it's even if it's just the dignity of knowing that you're suffering without uh without hurting others that that's that's enough but i didn't think about that second part you brought up which is that it's like it's literally like supposed to be soothing or not even soothing just like placating and uh preventing thrashing yeah. by people caught in the meat grinder like that is also a part of it yeah cuz you know there's always there's always a hug at the end of the rainbow yeah so a typical episode, because like I feel like a lot of people have actually like messaged me about the show. Like a lot of people have dared to venture into watching this show because of like how fucked up it sounds and everything. And I still I hope there are more people who won't watch it 
because it is like it does make you feel bad. Well, it's also just it is so aesthetically inert that yes. I honestly don't know how anybody who was not being paid would sit through it. It's like trying to read in a car. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You just kind of get nauseous the whole time. But like, what would you say like a typical episode? It's like, well, uh, it depends. Like which time period are we going to talk about? Which, which flash forward are we going to do? Cause like there's sometimes it's like, Oh, we're going to just be at this time frame, and we're going to just follow this family. But then some, that's one of the things that like gives it a, uh, a illusion of, of momentum is that you just by choosing where you're going to cut from your and, and cutting between within an episode, it gives it a narrative momentum that is totally uh, illusory. Uh, but uh, it's usually an episode. They uh, somebody has some problem. Uh, mm-hmm. They show Mandy Moore in a uh, hilarious old age makeup. Uh, which honestly, I don't think gets talked about enough. The fact that they hired Mandy Moore to be an old lady for most of this movie. Such an amazing hired Mandy Moore to be an old woman for like the vast majority of her scenes hired a thin guy to play a fat guy and just gave him a fat suit. Yeah. <laughs> like So many weird choices. Yeah. And so then the uh, there'll be some sort of conflict within the family and it will be resolved by both of the people standing in front of each other and just giving a incredibly inert inauthentic robotic speech and then they will yes. uh they'll they'll hug it out that's pretty much it like so a problem like one of the uh, like for example early on and sort of like m- early middle first season one of the problems is that uh Kevin over relies on Kate for emotional labor yeah and she, like he like she doesn't tell him this but um, the Joss Whedon guy that is fucking her, uh, notices this, that she'll like, if he calls her, he'll, she'll drop whatever he's doing, she's doing to help him. And he basically represents that to Kevin and Kevin, instead of like narcissistically, like denying it or being defensive, like, you know, where you could create drama or mm-hmm. friction or anything. Yeah. Um, he goes, Oh no, I'm, Oh, that's bad. Mm-hmm. And then like, Sets them up to have a date, like a date night, and calls her as a test to make sure she won't answer. Like this behavior that he's been doing for like 35 years. He's just like, oh, that's bad. Okay. I won't do that anymore. Yeah. And like is so, has gone in the other direction so hard that he's like setting up tests to make sure that she can be independent. Or like a, a problem will be like um, <laughs> Randall's dad, who this is amazing. Like, this is amazing. His dad's name is Shakespeare. Like <laughs> that was like his nickname on his bus. He rode where he like met uh, Randall's biological mother and like they both got addicted to heroin, which is like incredible. And there's some amazing shit with her character that I want to talk about in a little bit, but um, it'll be like, they're having like a culture clash over like, you know, is Ran- is Randall too like assimilated in this white community? And then they'll realize, like, hey, we're we're both right, and we're bo- we're both like fighting for justice in our own ways. And like Ran- like Randall is fighting for justice by like he's gonna like teach like kids how to commodity trade. So whereas okay. his dad was involved in civil rights, but they're both like valid. Yeah, I saw. So the last episode I watched is the last episode that they that was broadcast, uh, uh, the most recent one. Uh, it came out a couple weeks ago when we're recording this uh, in April of 2021, uh, and it is the episode where Kevin and uh, Kevin and Randall have been feuding big time over the yeah. care of uh, Mandy Moore, who not only has old age makeup but also is uh, has Alzheimer's, uh, and they're feuding over her care, and there's tension, and Kevin goes to. Uh, to Randall's house to apologize for what he now realizes is the fact that not that he did anything wrong, but that Randall is mad at him for uh, treating him differently for being black as a kid for, for othering him in some way for committing what Randall says in the episode, microaggressions against him, a way you love to talk to your family about 
Like that's the yeah. way you talk to your family is to talk about the microaggressions that you suffered from them. I mean, my God, just the thought, just that's the kind of stuff that like makes your spine kind of tingle. Like the, the, the HR assumption, you know, yeah. that like, this There's- is how intimate relations should refer to one another. This kind there of is, language. There is so much shit like that that, like, yeah, makes my, my, my spine tingle where it's like it's the NWO suggestion yeah. like that you should talk to your family that way. Or like I was thinking about another scene where it's like after seasons and seasons of building up Kate's body image issues, they have Kevin big give this big speech to the woman he knocked up about how like he basically has bulimia because he likes working out. And that's that's another thing where it's like, Oh, so you you can actually get addicted to working out and like feeling good. It's <laughs> yeah. actually bad for you. <laughs> you like shouldn't do that or walk anywhere or like do anything. Like it's all that's all bad for you actually because it it gives you uh, mental health. Yeah. Uh. So they have. So Kevin realizes that he has done microaggressions against his brother, and and then he uh, needs to be called out and called in, and he apologizes, and. Randall kind of gives him the cold shoulder because he doesn't feel like he really internalized the concern. And then they have an argument that is intercut with flashbacks of young Randall and young Kevin in Hollywood when Randall is like a nerd visiting LA for uh, Model UN and and Kevin is a struggling actor and there's tension and, and racial uh uh microaggressions that occur that you can watch and then go oh there's the microaggressions that he was talking about thank you for uh for thank you for underlining that ken olin and then they flash back to the 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 present i guess and then they have two more speeches and then they hug and nothing has actually happened nothing has changed he says he basically says i'm sorry for racism then Randall says, You're you don't really get how racist you were. And then he's like, Oh, I was really racist. I'm sorry. And it's like, okay, good. And then that's it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And the thing you pointed out about how like actually inert it is, and like what a temple grand and like trick that is to have everything fly around like twenty, thirty years. It, it to it, it's it's kind of it's vaguely reminiscent of uh you know how, <laughs> like, like whenever people are like, like, like the sort of centrist thing, the third way thing of being like, "Hey, don't forget, people still want to live in America, and this is still like a great place to live." And like, look at all this stu- stuff we did, and they all named things that were like seventy years ago. Yeah. And it's like it's the same. It's it's a similar ethos where it's like, yeah, nothing is happening in this show, really. Like, it just, every episode is pretty identical. Like, every season, you can really just kind of watch every, any episode, and it's the same as any before that until you get to the finale, and you're, like, done with one conversation. It's like very, it's like Dragon Ball Z in that way. <laughs> in that you, you know, you see, like, one tenth of the fight that Goku and, like, whatever alien he's going to fight are going to have. It's like that, but with, like, a frank conversation about racism or, like, body image yeah. issues. It's yeah, it, it's shittier Dragon Ball Z like for grown-ups. But um yeah, they they because like in on the show like not that much is happening, not that much time is actually passing in our like present timeline, but just flying around and like sort of dangling the keys in front of this in front of the viewers where it's like, oh see, they did the same thing in uh nineteen eighty one actually. Isn't that cr- what a parallel. Yeah. History repeats it, it, itself. Yeah. Like half the show is like, you know, an insurance commercial or like a very well produced like corporate anti bias training video. Yes. <laughs> Then the other half is like it's like tutorial f- like TV writing software. <laughs> like it's like this is what a parallel is. Yeah. You know, this is foreshadowing. Yeah, everything is is very much uh modular like that. You you've got you've got the structural stuff which is all about foreshadowing and, and parallelism and all that. And then you have the actual dialogue which is either these these speeches or banter. Yeah, and both of them are just—they pr- feel procedurally generated. Yeah, no, ca- every character might as well be delivering like a soliloquy. Yeah, it, it is. 
they don't like really like actually affect like their their words have no bearing on the previous person's words it's so fucked up and like it, it gives you the same thing as like a cgi rendering of a person that's too good yeah it, uncanny it, valley shit yeah but i mean i kind of think this will be like the most influential show of this like 20 year era i mean i i gotta say after i watched the debut of the uh of the fifth season which happened uh after covid had begun and yeah. they're and they're wearing masks and they're talking about how they're quarantining and shit i i definitely got that feeling of like oh yeah that's this is the cheat code now is to just be be uh be relevant in some in some very generic uh uh just reflexive sense and then you don't have to do anything else you can just use yeah software fill-ins for everything else and yeah and it, what's so crazy about that is like the turnaround for this show must be so fucking quick yeah it's like to fucking other... south park yeah it, it must be so quick and like it is actually to put together like a 30 minute to an hour script uh is that like fills all the slots and like accounts for commercials and like you know, most importantly, the audience will like take in and digest and think they enjoy it is like, it, it's difficult. And that's what makes me think Ken Olin is like a supreme evil <laughs> because he's, he sees all these events and he instantly processes like what Bill Gates wants you to think and then spits it out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, like, exactly. <laughs> it's great. Like it's, I've never seen anything like this. And I, I think like that, type of information processing ability could be used for good, but it's like definitely used for evil here. And I, I do think this is kind of what shows are going to be like for a very long time. They're going to be just latching on to whatever current thing, whatever thing that like, you know, Brooklyn dad defiant talks about. And then just like, so emotionally manipulative, like emotionally manipulative past any type of TV before it, I think. Yeah. And that's and it, there's going to be two there's two formats because one that has already exists and has already been the predominant thing on network television is of course the procedural, and that is where everybody's uh, grandpa watches. That's where your reactionaries they don't really need a a uh, an emotionally inflected type. They don't really even need their grievances uh, uh, specifically addressed. You just have guys with guns uh, arresting people that they are scared of and it's a, it's, it's just a perfect enactment of you know it, it it it's a cycle of of fear and then uh and then suppression of the fear through authority it's great but for the urban liberal who makes up you know a large percentage of consumers of entertainment and a huge percentage of people who engage in conversation about entertainment which i really do think is more important at this point because i mean at this certainly with streaming and I know uh, this is us as a network show, but you know that's that's a dwindling uh, uh, business model. There is no real connection between numbers and uh, like actual numbers of people watching it uh, and success. It really much is more about well, what is being talked about. So mm -hmm. for that for that group of people who want to talk about their shows, uh, this template, the, the the this is us Olin model it really does seem like it's the only thing that can fill that gap because you can't do the procedural shit for these people because they're too anxious about that kind of content. So instead, you just talk about everything that makes them anxious and then resolve it not through authoritarianism and a guy getting arrested, but by people having a frank discussion with one another. Yeah, it's so... That is so much of it. Like, it's people who, like... <laughs> I think like a lot of like dental hygienists and shit watch the show, like the few middle class jobs left in America. Yeah. Everyone all like the moms in those family watch the show. And I feel like it's a lot of people who it's like, yeah, they're worried about like, I don't know, like the alt right or something like these things that will like never happen in their lives or like affect them. But it's like, they just have this like sort of middle class anxiety because they think that's like sort of how you be a good person. But the one thing that is actually soothing about the show is that they can see all these issues worked out. Yeah, like they're they're, yes. they're like like for probably like two months last year they were like probably really nervous. They said something like you know racially insensitive 
like these aren't i don't really think these are people who like say things that are like outright racist but would say like yeah a microaggression and they're like tearing themselves up about it but they get to see how it should go if yeah. you do that on the right show. and that last episode i watched is a perfect example because uh because kevin doesn't do anything different he doesn't have to forsake anything or change mm-hmm. he just has to listen to what randall tells him internalize it and then regurgitate it to him in a way that he finds satisfactory and that yeah. is that that is the that is the soothing model that these people can imagine to 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 bed down the anxiety they have about what they might have said because oh as, as long as i the as long as i can, you can do that this is us and that means that you're not going to have to worry about you know being cast into perdition yeah that's ex- yeah exactly it it's yeah i i do have to say like i th- I've, I've watched like a lot of shows like this because that was like my original purview at first like i've seen a lot of council of dads which you know <laughs> fortunately got canceled <laughs> fortunately they cut the head off that part of the hydra uh i saw uh, a million little things like so many of these shows i think they're so this type of show that i think one day we maybe should have a term that's more descriptive of them than just you know one hour network drama because this really is like a distinct its own genre now these shows that look like insurance commercials yeah and i don't want to say that this is us is artful but there's like a sinister olin touch that i notice that i don't notice in the other ones like he's there's a little the most, arthurial uh there's a maker's mark there's yeah. a little, there's some auteurism there and there's like there's a swiftness with him where he's like instantly pounces, like instantly, like, oh, this is how I do the Black Lives Matter episode. This is how I do this. Like, it's by the way that only a guy who has been in TV so long and like has outlasted so many people and probably like fucked so many people <laughs> over to get there. Absolutely. Only a guy like him can do. And the only thing that like sort of gives me hope that we won't get too many shows like this is. Olin is such like a uniquely cynical person that I don't. I think there are people who are as cynical, but I don't think they have like Olin's quick thinking yeah. and ability to regurgitate. Yeah, he strikes he he is shameless and and he strikes quickly without mercy. He's like Cobra Kai. Yeah, exactly. He is yeah, that's he's always been around, he'll always be around. Olin's going to outlive all of us, everyone listening. He's going to outlive your <laughs> children. He's because he's been here forever. He's yep. the old one. Yeah, because when when your parents were in the seventies, he was there. Uh, when your parents are in their seventies, he's there too. Never really. He's in the hospital room when uh, when the triplets are being born. He's in the hospital room when she's being diagnosed. She's he's in the kitchen with you when you're having your frank discussions about body image. He's always there. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah he's been here since the start. Um, we are going to be haunted by his sort of like his deep ones. Yeah, <laughs> like the people that are writing the show, I am, you know, bookmarking their names because I want to see what evil shit they do in the future. Yeah, because it's going to be some I'm gonna spread through the galaxy. Learning from this guy, like learning how to write a TV show from this guy, it is like, yeah, that is like you got your board certification with Mangala. <laughs> that is horrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, I for one can't wait for uh, all the horrors to come. I can't wait. Like, oh my god. I cannot wait to see what awful shit like they like this they make for Zoomers. Oh my there's god! A, there's a hint of that in this. Like it's the one thing they're not swift enough for because there's a micro storyline where uh, one uh, one of Randall's kids uh, does a TikTok with another student about misgendering and like the teacher touching touching her hair, and, but like the TikTok looks like it's like too like a early '80s rap beat. And they're just, like, it's just not like what a TikTok is. Yeah, no, you and need to get actual young people to get the real aesthetics of it because that is one place where you can feel the old guy all over it. Did you see the episode where Randall's adopted daughter? So Randall adopted a daughter too, uh, mm-hmm. and she's a teenager, and she tells him that she's got to go to a, a debate, uh, a debate meet, and so they're driving to the debate meet. And then he, she has him pull over in front of a house, and he's like, where's the debate? And she says, there is no debate. 
and then she gives him a, a big speech about how this is the house where she was a uh, foster child and how traumatic it was. And then they come home and, you know, now they, they're closer than they were. And that is so in psychotic. <laughs> the the, the idea that this teenager who's deeply traumatized, as she describes, is just going to like lay a trap for this dude so that he can take a 40 minute drive with her so that they can conveniently throw some fucking flashbacks in the middle of while they well to to simulate narrative momentum that's that's another thing that is so fucking wicked about this show is that you know our oft-hated overused uh word trauma if a character has like severe trauma, like abusive foster home or, you know, someone dying, whatever, it's never like it never manifests like outward. Yeah. And it's like you should just you trauma just means you feel sad and any like antisocial or like bad behavioral consequence of it. It's unsaid, but it is kind of like you're a bad person. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like these are the this. these are the good people like this family is a good are the good people. And what makes them that? is that they in they just keep it inside. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of it. I mean, this is like this is part of like a culture cultural of of things where it's like, hey men, like don't hold it in. Toxic masculinity kills you. Men should cry. Like everyone should talk about their feelings. But like in practice, this show is just like shut like shut up and fucking take it and show you're good by being sad. Yeah. But still like doing all your work. Oh yeah, you got to got to do the work. I really like. I'm sorry I made you watch this. I'm sincerely. It's okay. It, it was tough. I have to say. I just kind of let a few go in the first season just go through them and just like just go through it. And yeah, I felt like insulation was being stuffed down my throat. It's just so stultifying, so uh, absent of any kind of dynamism within the characters, uh, within any of the the just the way that they fucking just kept switching times and made you and it may expect you to like be tricked into thinking <laughs> that that means something was happening that to me is the most infuriating part of the thing because that really was the the uh the aha moment clearly with this show is because yeah it, with absent the temporal shit there is no way you could make this a show nothing no, nothing happens. happens nothing happens and so he thought well what if we just mix the shit up and then have it happen and then and then just have stuff happen next to each other and then allow you to draw a conclusion from that. And once you get that that's what's happening, it it just becomes absolutely stultifying and and, would, and, and yeah. incredibly. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and then then in addition to just being this unwatchable thing with uh, with this garbage uh, uh, Viagra commercial aesthetic. Like half the, whenever uh, Randall and his wife are talking, I really feel like they should be in adjoining bathtubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is. I think it's important we watch it just for the scope and purpose of the series, but also because I do think out of everything, this is both like the worst to watch, like the worst fucking thing. Oh, absolutely. And also, like probably the least morally defensible. 100%. Like, this is, for whatever evil Law & Order did, which is a lot. Oh, I yeah, feel like no. Well, Law & Order has had a, 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 a deep negative cultural impact, certainly. Hugely. But I f kind of feel like this is worse, because, like, Law & Order is just, like, it's, like, justifying the criminal justice system, which is awful in America. Uh, and it's, like, it, it, I think it's helped, like, make people complacent in it and not think about it. I think this is us is worse because it's telling you to do that, but with the entire thing. Yeah, with everything in your life, with everything in yeah. life. Yeah, from like war to poverty to death to disease, like all of it. And it's, I am glad we're done with it. Absolutely. I hope, I hope I never watch it again, but I probably will. <laughs> You're a sicko. Have you watched all of it? Um, I'm like I'm caught up. But oh there's my some lord. Like thir second and third season stuff i'm like i've seen bits and pieces of all of them i thought it was academically important to see all of it like see the jack vietnam episodes <laughs> like see, see jack's death but like i'm like i'm fascinated to see where this goes because it's it's so fucking sick and 
sorted. I it's like I'm probably gonna check back within it, check back with it like twice a year for the rest of my life. Yeah, which will be shortened by this show. Absolutely. It's, yeah, you're 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 just inhaling carcinogens. I yeah no I I, I honestly like. People should watch like at least one scene from this show. Everyone should because it's like, I feel like we did it as best we could describing it. It's like, but there is a feeling it gives you yeah. that you just have to experience. Yeah, there, there, there is the the sensation of being surrounded by it, of yeah. being immersed in it. It's very, uh, it's it's it's, uh, sobering honestly, to feel it like take- in the mind in the mind realm of Ken Olin. Yeah, it takes over everything you're doing. Like, I watch a lot of these shows while I'm, like, you know, I'm, like, just, like, grind- mindlessly, like, grinding levels in Dark Souls or something or, like, you, you know, like, getting whatever bullshit done. And I, like, couldn't really do that <laughs> while watching the latest <laughs> season. It, like, affected me too much. Yeah. It was too, it, it was, and was it affecting your feeling. gaming? Were you, like, were you, were you doing worse were you finding kind yourself? Of, yeah, you're getting yeah, owned. I could, like I can't beat this this boss for some reason. That's kind of what happened. Like I um, I was doing uh, for people who play Dark Souls three. I was d- doing uh, in New Game Plus. I was trying to beat Sister Freed, and it was just like the vibe was too bad. <laughs> like it was too fucking bad. Well. I I'm happy for you that you never have to watch it again. And happy very happy. For the yeah, you you keep me posted on whatever else happens <laughs> in, in the in the fam in the Pearson's uh, annals. I'm gonna start a Pearson DM. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. I for all everyone else who does not have to watch this again, you know, count your lucky stars. But you know. Your pa- if your parents are watching this, I think you should be able to like talk to the authorities or something. Absolutely, there should be, like, yeah, should yeah. Be, like, this sh- you should be able to get at least like a home call <laughs> if you know that your folks are watching this stuff. There should be. This should be like you totally switch things up. Like confront your parents about using the show, like they would uh, if you use drugs. Mm-hmm. Like there's gonna. We need to have some uncomfortable talks in America, and this is it. Yeah, this is us. This is us. Well, that about does it. I'm excited to see what awful shit they do, but signing off as always, I'm Felix Peterman. Matt Christmas. See you next time on our stories. <laughs>